What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smark Out Moment Smack Talk podcast. This is the WWE Clash of Champions 2017 post-show, where I will be recapping the events that transpired if you didn't watch the pay-per-view, and giving my opinions about what happened on the pay-per-view if you just want to know what I think about it. I am sick as I've been recently, and I'm going to be cutting it short, uh, relatively short, relatively speaking, because I'm just drained out of all my friggin' energy, and it's not from the pay-per-view being so massively well that, you know, I was cheering the whole night and stuff like that, it's just a matter of uh, being worn out and stuff like that, but nonetheless, I do want to talk about some different things in the pay-per-view, which overall I was not thoroughly impressed with, but I didn't dislike either, it was one of those things where there were some positives, some negatives, kind of balanced between the two, and nothing was bad, really, but, uh, it was a mediocre type of pay-per-view. Um, it was a, basically an extended edition of SmackDown, where, uh, I almost called it Smack Talk, uh, where we had a couple of good matches, and sometimes it's fine, um, for the last pay-per-view of the year, I kind of want something a little bit better, but we did just come off of Survivor Series, and that was an amazing pay-per-view, so I'm willing to give them a little bit of a benefit of the doubt, People are tired, they've been doing these tours, they just did the tribute to the troops and stuff, and eventually, you just kind of phone it in a little bit. And I think that some people did here, some people didn't, some people tried their hardest, and for better or worse, um, you can kind of tell in certain situations. And we might as well start off with, well, I mean, technically we should start off with me saying, my name is Tony Mango, if you're unaware, but I think that you guys pretty much know by now. If you don't, you can read the description below and all that. That's not going to be some groundbreaking kind of thing where it's like, oh, by the way, my name is, uh, I don't know, Chet Gunderson, and I've been fooling you the whole time, ha ha, I got you guys, or anything like that. Um, <coughs> there you go. Won't even edit that one out, just to prove I'm coughing up a lung here. Um... We might as well start off with the pre-show, is what really we should start off with here. Uh, that was Mojo Raleigh versus Zack Ryder, because the rest of the pre-show you don't need to know about. Nobody did anything. There was interviews, people talking about how they were going to win the championship if they weren't the champion. People are saying that they were going to retain it if they were the champion. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing of note, uh, except for a funny little joke where... The New Day were on the um, social media lounge, and Xavier Woods was like, no, there's no cracks in the New Day. Nobody can see the New Day's crack and whatever like that. And I thought it was kind of funny. Child and humor, but funny. Uh, the Mojo Raleigh-Zack Ryder match, I had mentioned before, I'm very glad that they put this on the card because it justifies the feud, and there was no reason not to put it on the card. So that's a positive. Uh, negatives, it wasn't really all that good. Like... It was fine, but nobody's going to care. And this is exactly the type of thing where they didn't impress enough that I think that they're going to be made any bit of a priority over the next couple of weeks. And before we know it, this feud is going to be over without it really amounting to much. Uh, Raleigh and Ryder needed to really kind of wow people a little bit to get more attention given to themselves. And I don't feel like they did. Uh, Raleigh is the same character as he was before, except for a heel. And they changed his music, but he didn't change anything about himself, really. He still, like, ran to the ring and everything. And I just didn't like the vibe of it. Like, it it could have been more intense. It had a little bit of intensity to it. And Raleigh was trying to make it seem like he was, like, really bitter about everything, but I didn't buy it. And I ultimately just kind of don't care. Uh, the right man won. Raleigh should have won this match, and he did, thankfully. But it's not going to lead anywhere. And I got a feeling that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see the really phoned in, I don't want to work too hard to set up this episode of SmackDown type stuff. And the same thing for Raw, because it's the holidays. People are going to phone it in. Uh, I'm kind of doing the same thing a little bit with a quicker review tonight. But I think that that's going to let them fall by the wayside, and we're not going to hear much about this anymore. And when it comes to the Royal Rumble... There's going to be way too much that WWE is going to be focused on, and this is just going to fade away into nothing. So I feel a little bit bad about that when it comes to them, but at the same time, if they would have done a better job, then they would have secured that kind of future. So we'll have to see about that. Thankfully, though, the first match of the actual card was phenomenal. And it's not some AJ Styles pun. I just forgot to say the word stellar. 
uh, or fantastic or awesome or anything else like that. Uh, the United States Championship triple threat match was Baron Corbin going in as the champion, Bobby Roode going in as the guy that most people thought would end up winning the match, and Dolph Ziggler leaving as the champion. Very surprised about that. I did not see that one coming at all. Uh, I know that Peter was bringing it up in the Mega Maniacs chat of that he was a little bit worried that Ziggler was going to end up winning that. And I kind of wrote that off as, I don't know why people are worried about this. Uh, Ziggler is like totally not going to win. What are you talking about? That kind of a thing. And Ziggler wins. <laughs> um, so the guy that I thought was guaranteed to take the pinfall actually gets the pinfall. And he not only gets the pinfall, he pins the champion, which really is surprising because I would have thought if anything, they would have gone with Bobby Roode, like maybe Roode puts down Corbin and Ziggler gets a quick roll up kind of thing on Roode, but nah, Baron Corbin. So there's a couple things to unpack here. Is this a title win that they gave to Dolph Ziggler to try to appease him to make sure that he doesn't quit because his contract is coming up soon. And he's been talking a lot recently about how he's possibly going to be leaving. So was this a matter of, We'll give you the title if you stay around and kind of a, an act of good faith type of thing. Or did they actually just want Dolph Ziggler to win the title? Because you got to remember too, Dolph Ziggler just popped up into this feud. Baron Corbin and Bobby Roode were kind of feuding and the Roode and Ziggler feud was pretty much done. Ziggler had nothing with Corbin. He just sort of popped up and made it a triple threat and now he's the champion. So Corbin is looking for retaliation. Bobby Roode, I'm sure, is not out of the picture entirely. And Ziggler is now our United States champion. I am unapologetically a big fan of Dolph Ziggler, so I am very, very in support of this. Uh, I do like Byron Corbin to a certain extent, and I, of course, like Bobby Roode. So this was kind of a surprise win and a surprise happy change of uh, pace, and I'm all for it. Why not? I'm really curious if this is going to be one of those things where on Tuesday night he drops the title to Roode or to Corbin again or something like that. And I hope that that's not the case, but we've seen uh, Stranger Things happen, and I've seen Stranger Things season one and two, and uh, <laughs> it's a lame ass joke. That's the best that you can get out of me today. I'm tired, but uh, we are going to be paying attention to this, of course, with with the Royal Rumble in mind, with WrestleMania in mind, and I'm very curious if Dolph Ziggler is going to be retaining that title into maybe even past WrestleMania, or if he's going to be dropping it around the Royal Rumble. We could see Rude and Ziggler, and we could see Baron Corbin doing something else, but this is kind of making me a little bit concerned about Baron Corbin, because if they had him booked the way that he's been booked this year, they give him these little wins, and then they kind of crap him out over and over again. Uh, that money in the bank meant nothing in the long run, and his United States title reign was basically putting up a fight against Sin Cara and losing to Dolph Ziggler. So if he doesn't win the title back, I don't think he's going to be doing pretty much of anything at WrestleMania. I think he's going to be in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and that's it. And that's not really good for Baron Corbin's future. Rude, I think he's got that sealed. He's going to be doing something in the future that's pretty good. And maybe that is the United States title win. Maybe that's the whole transitional thing. You go from Corbin to Ziggler to Rude, and that way you can kind of piggyback and uh, pick up the bones, I guess you could say, and do Corbin and Rude without having one of them pin the other one or something like that. I don't know. I'm very interested, though. So I like this a lot. The match was great. Uh, second match that was really good, too. The Usos, The New Day, Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin, and Rusev and Aiden English for the uh, Fatal 4-Way for the SmackDown Tag Team Championship, which I admittedly missed a good portion of because the network was crapping out for me. Yet what I did see and what I saw that was very fuzzy and everything was pretty great. Uh, Chad Gable standing out as one of the best people in the whole match. He and Kofi Kingston really put up the energy quite a bit. The Usos held it down, too. Uh, Rusev and Aiden English felt a little bit odd here and there, especially that one part where Aiden English was, I guess, supposed to break up a pin and wasn't paying any attention whatsoever. But the match was good. Uh, cl could have been a clusterfuck, and it wasn't, which goes to show that these guys do have some good uh, rapport with each other and that the tag team division's fun. Uh, the Bludgeon Brothers eventually are going to be in the mix. Uh, Brie Sango, of course, is going to be in the mix. The Ascension. I'm assuming somebody like the Authors of Pain will probably be coming up at some point over the next couple of months. And uh, maybe Sanity, too. I don't know. And I just uh, I enjoy these teams all going head-to-head. -head, so thumbs up when it comes to this one, too. 
I did think that the New Day was going to win those titles, but I'm not too shocked that they didn't. Uh, that was kind of one of my, like, out on a limb, let me put this suggestion out there so that way if I'm right, then the people that are shocked are going to be like, wow, Tony got it, and I didn't. <laughs> uh, the Usos retaining, though, perfectly fine with that. The Usos are a great tag team. It would have been weird if they would have given it to Rusev in English or even to Gable and Benjamin. They're not suited for that, I don't think. So, Usos, New Day, I'm cool with it. Why not? Uh, the unfortunate part of the night that I was the least into was the SmackDown Women's Championship Lumberjack match. And I know, I know, people are going to complain, oh, of course it was the women's match. It wasn't because it was the women's match. It was actually because it was a Lumberjack match. And I like Lumberjack matches now and again, but this just felt sloppy. Uh, the entire match was over and over again. One person tosses the other one on the outside. Everybody beats him up, throws him back in. And I know that that's the gimmick of the Lumberjack match, but I kind of wanted something more out of it. Natty and Charlotte, I've seen them fight enough. Nothing special. You know, I don't remember anything that they did in the match, and uh, I doubt that their next encounter is going to be anything all that impressive, too. But it was fine. Like, there, I don't have any issues with it. It wasn't like it was like Botchamania City or something like that. It was just kind of blah. And more so, the Riot Squad seemed pointless. We had, what was it, seven people on the outside, Naomi, Lana, Tamina, Carmella, and the Riot Squad. And it would have been weird if, like, Lana, Tamina, and Carmella had turned babyface ahead of time. But if we would have had some people supporting Charlotte and some people supporting Natty, I think that this would have gone down better. Instead, it was just everybody against everybody. And that meant that when Charlotte went to the outside, everybody just beat her up for a second, threw her back in. When Natty went to the outside, it was kind of the same sort of thing. And just nothing special. And I feel like the Riot Squad serves no purpose. Like, they don't strike me as building towards a title match kind of a thing. Especially not when it comes to Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan. And I don't want Ruby Riot versus Charlotte as, like, the match we're building to for WrestleMania. At this point, the SmackDown women's situation, I don't want any kind of matches for WrestleMania. Like, you give me, like, Charlotte versus uh, Tamina? Nah. You give me Becky versus Charlotte? I don't care. I've seen it before. Ruby Riot versus Naomi? No. I really just don't care, and I don't want to see the Ruby Riot, uh, the whole Riot Squad thing versus three other women match. I don't want that to happen another 20 times. Really, it's just, I don't care. And I, I want somebody new to be brought into the mix. Uh, maybe it's a trade, maybe it's somebody from NXT. I, I doubt either of those are going to happen, but I don't know. I, just, I wasn't into this. And at the end of it, Natty gets on a microphone. She's being interviewed by Kayla Braxton. And she essentially says, if everybody's going to turn their back on me, I'm going to turn their back my back on them. Okay. So you either take time off and I'm okay with that. Or you quit in a really shitty way. Or you don't do anything. I don't care. <laughs> That took us into a quick squash with the Bludgeon Brothers defeating Brizongo. No surprises here whatsoever. We said that ahead of time. This had to be a squash. It couldn't have gone down any other way. So there's nothing much to it, which means there's nothing much to review or to react to. It's exactly how it should have gone down, exactly what was expected, and took up, what, three minutes or something like that, maximum? So they didn't screw up the Bludgeon Brothers. And Brizongo can bounce back from this. And I hope that we see something good come out of the Ascension with that. But that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to put a lot, a lot of faith in that. And that's really where I'm more interested in seeing this going. Is that going to be built up or are the Bludgeon Brothers just going to be the next number one contenders or something like that? So I am interested. And I'm interested to see what the next Fashion Files stuff is going to be about because this should be over at this point. And I like both these tag teams to a certain extent. So, yay, I guess. I don't know. No really, like, complaints, but it is what it is. Uh, we had the semi-main event, which could have been the main event, really. 
the Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus Shinsuke Nakamura and Randy Orton match with Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan both as referees, which I'll uh, be a little harsh on, I guess, by saying this was a scenario where all that mattered was the end. And the match itself was fine, but it was a little bit chaotic and that might be on purpose because the whole point was supposed to be that there was confusion and stuff, but I didn't really enjoy it too much. Uh, there were some good parts and, and like it was a generic tag team match. It was like the main event of SmackDown. So it really just ends up being, did you like the finish or not? And you got to know ahead of time, Daniel Bryan's going to start arguing with Shane McMahon. You know that that's going to happen. It, it's a guarantee. But whether Shane McMahon turns or Daniel Bryan turns or there's just some kind of a distraction and that leads to whatever, it could have gone a couple different ways. And I don't think that this is bad. Uh, I think it makes sense that Daniel Bryan would get frustrated and that he would do a fast count. But I don't really love where this is going. So it more so needs to be a retroactive thing. If I can look back in hindsight and say this was the start of a great uh, feud, then maybe I'll like it better. If I look back and I'm like, oh man, this turned out to be like Shane McMahon wants to fight Daniel Bryan, but he's not cleared. So Shane McMahon picks Randy Orton in his stead and we get Randy Orton versus Shane McMahon at WrestleMania. I don't give a shit whatsoever. Really, at this point, if Shane McMahon fights anybody at WrestleMania, I only want it to be Triple H. I don't want it to be anybody else. And I don't really want that match to happen. So, really, it's more so, how do they get Daniel Bryan to do something out of this? That That's the thing I'm interested in. I'm glad Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn aren't gone. I didn't expect them to be. But I'm also glad that they didn't even try to do that. Like, the whole John Cena gets fired, shows up two weeks later, that kind of bullshit. And, uh... Nakamura not taking the pinfall and Randy Orton getting screwed out of it. Sure, why not? I like that. That led us to the final match of the night, the AJ Styles versus General Hall WWE Championship match. Glad that we had Styles retain here. The match was okay, but again, nothing too, too special. And um, there were a couple points where I was like, uh-oh, maybe they're going to give that title back to Jinder. Thankfully, that didn't happen because that would have been a huge mistake. Uh, so I, give, I guess I should give them credit for that, that they got me thinking that that was going to happen sometimes. And in the grand scheme of things, I probably would have booked something similar to this if I were working the uh, creative team. And I can't fault them for it. They tried to put on the best match that they could, and we should just move on. That's kind of my feelings. Like... I don't want to see another Jinder Mahal and AJ Styles match. And I really want Jinder Mahal to just move on to a completely different feud outside of the main event. I don't know who with, uh, cause who's there left really maybe John Cena, but I don't really care enough for that. And, uh, maybe he could go over to raw. Maybe he can try to work himself into the tag team division with the Singh brothers. I don't know, but I kind of just want this to be over with. And, I liked the match enough. Didn't love it. So really the pay-per-view just ended with kind of like, all right, there you go. That's the end of it. Let me start working on my article. Let me start working on my podcast, that kind of a thing. And I actually had more fun with like the beginning of uh, talking smack with the Usos than I did with this match, but yeah, that doesn't really matter. So really my, uh, my low point of the night was the women's championship match. My highlight being the United States title match. And it was just a B level block kind of a pay-per-view uh in certain ways and in other ways it was like hey look at this united states title match that's really cool hey look at this uh tag team title match that was pretty good so that about sums it all up and um i want to know what you guys have to say about this so make sure that you leave your comments below positive or negative agree or disagree doesn't have to be one or the other and uh fill them in either on youtube's comment section or if you're listening to itunes or stitcher just go to the website itself and leave a comment if you can and if you are on youtube Hit that subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications because the next couple of things that we've got coming your way, hot tags, of course, because it's always one of the first things of the week. Then we got the mailbag for December coming up on Wednesday, I think. And at the end of the week, I'm going to be trying to record that 2017 Smart Out Moment Awards. So that will be posted towards the end of the 
whole year, uh, possibly the 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th. I haven't quite figured that out yet, exactly when the best time to, you know, balance that out would be, but i got to record it first, so <laughs> stay tuned for that kind of stuff, everybody. Uh, who knows what's coming in uh, 2018, but I'll figure that out uh, past the whole one to watch and future endeavors forecast. And if you want to be aware of anything else that's happening, go to smartoutmoment.com itself and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at smartoutmoment. You can follow me all over the place on a bunch of other things like Fanboys Anonymous and, uh, of course, my A Mango Tree and Tony Mango stuff. And that's about it. So thanks for listening to this review, everybody. I want to thank you not just for that, but for dropping those comments below if you do that, too. And I will see you next time. This has been another Smart Out Moment, and I'm being counted out.